In this tutorial, we're going to be looking at the Output Files section. Now the first thing we need to do is set the output directory. Now we can specify that completely by using the folder browser. So here we're looking at the um, folder that contains the input uh, images. And we could select a, a subdirectory, for instance uh, this one, uh, NSG, and save all our uh, output images uh, to that subdirectory. But there's a much easier way of doing that. If I reset this field back to its default, then NSG will automatically save all the output images to an NSG subdirectory. And if that directory doesn't already exist, it will create it for us. I like to uh, add a postfix to my files, and this not only different, differentiates the output files from the input, it also lets you know that you've run NSG on them. If uh, you're using the free version of uh, NSG, you'll be creating fully normalized uh, images. And that's OK, but it, it does come with some disadvantages. So, for example, during our normalization process, we're multiplying the target images by a scale factor, and we're subtracting a gradient from them. And this means that the pixel values within that image may well exceed the uh, 0 to 1.0 range. And before we save those images back to disk, we have to truncate those pixel values back to that uh, allowed 0 to uh, 1.0 uh, range. And this means we're losing some of our dynamic range in the brightest and dimmest parts of our image. Not only that, the uh, normalized images, being full-sized images, take up a lot of disk space. And uh, this means the uh, not only does it use more for disk space, it's increasing the uh, file I.O., which uh, significantly uh, reduces uh, NSG's performance. And finally, if you're using RGB uh, images, then this option only allows us to use a single weight for all three channels. Um, because we're only allowed to specify one FITS header for uh, image integration to use as the uh, weight value. On the other hand, if we select normalization data, none of those drawbacks uh, are factors. Um, now we're creating local, norm local normalization files, and these small data files contain the instructions to tell image integration what to do. So for example, they contain the um, uh, scale factor that the uh, image needs to be multiplied by. It contains the gradient that needs to be subtracted from the image. And when image integration does these operations internally, it's not restricted to the 0 to, to 1.0 range. So we get no reduction in our uh, dynamic range. Um, it also allows us to uh, um, apply a different weight for each uh, RGB channel, which is uh, rather nice as well. But uh, this option has created a little bit of confusion that I would like to uh, clear up now. And that's, if we don't use this option, you can see that we're storing our end weight uh, value in a FITS header. But when we're using local normalization files, this changes to using a very new um, weight uh, algorithm in uh, image integration called uh, PSF Scale SNR. Now, this uh, um, new uh, algorithm came long after the original uh, PSF uh, weight uh, algorithms. And it's now using exactly the same algorithm that uh, NSG has always used. It's using the signal-to-noise ratio um, squared. So does this mean that uh, it would uh, produce exactly the same weights whether we used uh, PixInsight's local normalization uh, process or whether we use NSG? And the answer is not quite. In both cases, 
they would be using the same uh, algorithm within uh, image integration. Uh, we would be using the same uh, noise estimate that PixInsight calculated during uh, pre-processing. But the scale factor will vary between the two. If the uh, local normalization data files were created by uh, NSG, they will contain the scale factor that NSG calculated, and uh, hence the results will be uh, slightly different to uh, PixInsight's. Uh, so, to summarize, providing our local normalization data file was created by NSG, then PSF scale SNR will produce exactly the same result that uh, nWeight would do, except that it's for each channel instead of an average for uh, all three uh, channels. If we're using normalization data, we don't need to create um, fully normalized images. The option is still there to do so if you want to, um, because, for, for example, you might want to uh, uh, blink through your um, normalized images just to check how well the normalized uh, process uh, actually was. But those normalized images are not going to get used, and it just uh, takes uh, extra time and disk space to uh, create them. The gradient images uh, checkbox that's again entirely just for your own uh, interest. If you wish, you can uh, um, save the gradients that were subtracted from the images, uh, which might uh, be uh, interesting uh, for you to see what's, uh, what's happening. But they're not needed, and again, it will uh, slow down the process and take up more disk space. If you're going to be using drizzle integration after you've uh, used uh, image integration, you need to check this box. And uh, what that does is it simply uh, tells NSG to um, find the uh, Drizzle data files. And uh, when it uh, invokes image integration, when we uh, exit NSG, it will uh, add the uh, Drizzle data to image integration automatically for your convenience. I like to uh, add a wait postfix to my files. And uh, that's uh, useful because then in a, a directory listing, we can uh, immediately see what the weights uh, actually are. And it also means that the weights are visible in uh, image integration, either directly or via uh, tooltips. I like to overwrite uh, my uh, data files so that multiple runs don't uh, end up uh, using a vast amount of uh, disk space. And it's also nice to save a CSV file so that we can uh, later on uh, graph various properties that our uh, imaging session uh, uh, resulted in. So I'd now like to go and uh, have a look at some of the files that uh, this created. So here we have our uh, input images. And uh, the, the uh, file at the bottom is a process, an NSG process icon that I uh, created earlier. And we can see that NSG has automatically created our uh, NSG uh, subdirectory. And we can see that uh, here are our uh, local normalization uh, data files. We can also see that um, it's created a log file. So if you have any uh, problems, uh, this uh, file should uh, contain lots of uh, useful information. So uh, we can see uh, um, it processing uh, all our target images. And if we go down to the bottom, it gives us a summary as to uh, uh, what uh, uh, the results uh, uh, produced. We have an NSG results.nsg file, and that contains um, a small uh, cached um, set of data. And uh, that's useful if we uh, want to run up NSG again later on. Um, and it means we don't have to rerun NSG in order to uh, see the uh, transmission and uh, weight graphs. And finally, if we had the uh, CSV uh, option checked, um, we can uh, load this uh, CSV file into your uh, favorite uh, spreadsheet program 
and then you can graph uh, any uh, aspects of uh, your imaging uh, session. So for example, um, this is uh, the spreadsheet in, uh, in Google uh, Sheets. I've uh, highlighted the uh, row that contains the uh, reference uh, image. Um, and yeah, we can uh, then uh, graph uh, uh, lots of uh, data. We have the uh, weight that uh, was uh, applied, the uh, very accurate signal to noise ratio. And this is a signal to noise ratio that you can really trust because the signal was calculated from the uh, differential uh, photometry. We can see the uh, brightness scale factor that the images were multiplied by and the, uh, the noise um, estimate that uh, was used. Uh, that was a value that's taken from a FITS header that uh, PixInsight calculated during uh, uh, pre-processing. And we have, uh, if they're available, uh, we'll also uh, show you some of the uh, values from the uh, FITS header, the altitude and air mass and uh, exposure, and the date of the uh, observation. And finally, it shows you the uh, uh, output uh, um, local normalization uh, file where they were saved. So I hope you've uh, found that uh, useful and uh, tune in to the uh, next uh, tutorial.